علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما رب العالمين so inshallah I just want to address a couple of points before we move on from the issue of al-shafa'ah the last topic we talked about intercession and the first thing was an ayah that came up while we're answering questions and actually was an ayah that I wanted to include within the lesson itself uh, where Allah Azza wa Jal says وَيَعْبُدُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ مَا لَا يَضُرُّهُمْ وَلَا يَنْفَعُهُمْ وَيَقُولُونَ هَأُولَاءِ شُفَعَاءُنَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ is where Allah says, and they worship instead of Allah what does not bring them harm nor benefit. And they say, to, meaning to the ones that they are worshiping, they will intercede for us with Allah Azza wa Jal. Then Allah says, قُلْ أَتُنَبِّئُونَ اللَّهَ بِمَا لَا يَعْلَمُوا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ He says, are you informing Allah of what He does not know in the heavens and the earth? Meaning what? Meaning are these intercessors? No, they're saying they will intercede for us and Allah is telling them, are you telling Allah about what he does not know? Like these are nothing, but you're claiming that they will intercede for you. So if Allah is denying that claim, it means they can intercede. So this ayah tells you that intercession was not understood properly and not applied properly can be a gateway towards what? Shirk in Allah Azza wa Jal hell and towards Allah uh, Shirk in Allah Azza wa Jal. That one of the reasons why people will commit Shirk in Allah Azza wa Jal, worship others with Allah, is because they will say that these things that we worship benefit us with Him. They will speak on our behalf, they will intervene, they'll ask for our sins to be forgiven, they'll protect us and they will elevate us, right? So if you don't understand the topic of intercession properly, it can lead you away from Allah Azza wa Jal. So you want to have a balance between those who reject it and those who misapply it and exaggerate it. So we have to affirm, as we said in the lesson, that there is a shafa'ah that belongs to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he is the best of shafi' and then to the other prophets of Allah and to the angels and to the righteous. So that has to be affirmed. But unlike... The worldly shafa'ah, it's not a savior syndrome. That is, it's not, I'll do whatever and the shafi'ah will come and help me. That's it. Just like in the dunya. Whatever trouble I'll be in, I'll find someone, if you have a father or an uh, uh, important relative. Whatever trouble I'm in, he can come and intervene and I'll be fine. So it doesn't work like that. Because Allah Azza wa Jal is the one who sets the limit of that shafa'ah. Who can intercede? Who will be eligible for that intercession? And when it can happen? So that's the difference. So, as we said again, shafa'ah can be asked from Allah Azza wa Jal. Ya Allah, give me the shafa'ah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. But while the Prophet is dead, can you ask him for shafa'ah? No. We said that is inappropriate. There is no precedence for it, and it falls into either the category of bid'ah or shirk in Allah Azza Jal, and we've explained that. Now, we have also to understand that those who may ask the Prophet ﷺ for shafa'a today, whether it is put into poems or into nasheeds or into their dua, they're doing this as a way, as an expression of their love for Rasulullah ﷺ, right? Because if you ask them about it, how they imagine it, it's an expression of attachment to him, alayhi salatu wasalam, right? You with me? So this is how they relate to him. So I love Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. I'm very close to him. How do I express that? Ya Rasulullah, shifa'alana. Ya Rasulullah, give us shifa'a, this and this. So you understand that there's an emotional element to it? So when you want to address it, and tell somebody who's doing that, that it's wrong, understand the emotional element in it. And that these emotions have to be redirected in ways that Allah Azza wa Jal loves. And we have to differentiate, all of us, between two types of love. There's love that is shari'i and sunni. Meaning according to the sharia of Allah Azza wa Jal, he loves it, he legislates it, he wants it. According to the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there is a love that is shirki bid'i. 
It's shirk and bid'ah. You say, okay, I'm not really getting it. Give me an example. You say, the clearest example can be seen with Isa alayhi salam. Right? طيب. Are we supposed to love Isa alayhi salam? Yes. Why do we love Isa alayhi salam? Because he's what? A prophet of Allah among the best of the prophets of Allah. So it's an obligation on us to believe in that and also to love him accordingly. Right? You cannot be a Muslim and say, I don't love Isa alayhi salam. You have to love him. طيب. Now the Christians, do they love Isa? They love. And the Christians can come and tell you, we love him more than you, you guys love him. You say, because we cry when we hear about him. We have his picture or what we imagine his picture is. We talk about him more often. So that means that we love him more than you guys love him. We say that there is love that is, as we said, shari'i, sunni. And there's an exaggerated love that Allah Azza wa Jal hates. And it would take you away from the one that you love. So is loving Isa alayhi salam as God a love that Allah loves? Or loving him as the son of God or as the creator of the heavens and the earth or as the one who will save you? Is that something that Allah loves? Okay, so now we've really deviated with that love and took it far into an extreme that had taken you away from Isa and take you away from Allah Azza wa Jal. So that's not a love that is shari'i and sunni, but it's what? Shirki and bid'i. Right? And it will lead you to practices that Allah hates and practices that Isa alayhi salam himself renounces. Is that clear? So take another example, Ali ibn Abi Talib and Alul Bayt in general. We're supposed to love them, right? Radiallahu anhum. So we're supposed to love them. Ali ibn Abi Talib is a sahabi. The Prophet sallallahu loved him. Alul Bayt belong to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the righteous among them deserves our love. طيب. There come some sects who will come and tell you we love them more than you do. Because we cry when we mention al Hussein, flagellate ourselves. We, you know, weep. Uh, mention them. We have anniversaries for them. This and this and that. How about you guys? We'll say, is that a love that Allah approves of? No, it's not. So that's a deviation. That's a deviation. Right? Going away from Ali ibn Abi Talib. If Ali ibn Abi Talib would see this, he would condemn it and curse it. Right? If Alul Bayt, who are upon the Sunnah of Muhammad وسلم, would see that, they would disassociate themselves from it. So this is definitely what? An extreme love. So your love can go to an extreme that can compete with loving Allah Azza wa Jal. And that's it no longer a legitimate love. So all of us, subhanAllah, could be prone to that. I mean, you're supposed to love your kids, right? But you could love your kids so much that that love could compete with Allah's love. Right? So that is a love with Allah Azza wa Jal. And that's not permissible. So now when we go to Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam and those who love him so much that they use the shafa'a to express that love, we say the same thing. You could love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam the appropriate amount of love, the legitimate amount of love, or you could love him so much that you start to what? Make him a partner with Allah azza wa jal, and that is shirk in Allah azza wa jal. So there is a limit that you cannot cross, right? So we have to tell that person, yes, love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but that's not the appropriate expression of that love. There are other ways and other things that you can do, right? So that's clear, inshallah, the distinction between all types of love and that when love moves out of its bounds, is no longer approved by Allah azza wa and it does not lead to his pleasure, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you have questions about that, inshallah, during the Q&A, we could address it or readdress it, inshallah. Now, after the shafa'ah, uh, Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, now continues with the foundations of the sunnah, right? And he says, وَالْإِيمَانُ أَنَّ الْمَسِيحَ الدَّجَّالَ خَارِجٌ مَكْتُوبٌ بَيْنَ عَيْنَيْهِ كَافِرٌ وَالْأَحَادِيثُ الَّذِي جَاءَتْ فِيهِ وَالْإِيمَانُ بِأَنَّ ذَلِكَ كَائِنٌ He says, and believing that the imposter, the lying messiah, is gonna appear. مَكْتُوبٌ بَيْنَ عَيْنَيْهِ كَافِرٌ Written between his eyes, kafir, disbeliever. 
and the hadith that came about him and the iman belief that this is going to happen. And he adds, Rahimahullah, wa anna Isa ibn Maryam alayhi salam yanzilu fayaqtuluhu bi babi lud. And that Isa alayhi salam will descend and he will kill that imposter Messiah at the gate of Lud or the gate in Lud. So here, Imam Ahmed is talking about some of the signs of the Day of Judgment, the major signs of the Day of Judgment, right? And first he's talking about Al-Masih al-Dajjal. And then he talks about Isa ibn Maryam alayhi salam. And he says, part of the foundations of the Sunnah, because multiple hadiths came affirming this, is to believe that these two things are going to happen. Now before I go into Al-Masih al-Dajjal, I'll briefly touch on Al-Mahdi. Okay, because there's some connection. So I'll briefly touch on Al-Mahdi. Even though Imam Ahmad does not talk about him. So Al-Mahdi, there are some authentic hadith telling us who Al-Mahdi is. Al-Mahdi means what, by the way? What does Al-Mahdi mean? The guided. The guided, right? So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says or said about Al-Mahdi, Al-Mahdi yu minna ahlul bayt. Al-Mahdi is from the household or the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the children of Fatima and it says in the hadith. And the hadith described that he is a khalifa that will be on the my final days and he will be a Muslim khalifa. And he said alayhi salatu was salam يملك سبع سنين he will rule for seven years يملأ الأرض عدلا كما ملئ الجورة he will fill the land with justice as it was filled with injustice and that prophecy from the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم tells us that المهدي is a man right a normal man but that Allah عز وجل chooses him and selects him to be a leader who will be guided on the last day or towards the end of times. And they consider Al-Mahdi to be one of the, or the first major sign of the Day of Judgment because when Al-Mahdi comes, he will be followed by the battle, the epic battle, we'll talk about it. And then he will be followed by Ad dajjal and then Isa ibn Maryam descending. So Al-Mahdi is the first of those things that will happen. So his name is Muhammad ibn Abdullah as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, يوافق اسمه اسمي واسم أبيه اسم أبي So his name will be Muhammad ibn Abdullah from the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam We said from that family of Fatima He describes him physically as being أجل الجبهة So he has kind of a large forehead and it might indicate that his hair has receded so you can see that he has a big forehead أقنى الأنف أقنى الأنف means that his nose is thin and pointed maybe, or a, a bit pointed, or elevated at the end. Aqna al-anf. And we said that he will rule for seven years. And al-Mahdi, right, has you know, no special powers, no special ability, except that he will be a leader for Muslims at a critical age. And he says, alayhi salatu was salam, yuslihu Allahu fi layla. Allah will reform him or fix him in a night or overnight. So what does it mean to reform or fix Al-Mahdi in a night or overnight? It means Wallahu A'lam that Allah Azza wa equips him, right? Uh, takes him, uh, allows him to repent, makes him more righteous, or equips him to handle the affairs of an ummah overnight. And that is a favor from Allah Azza wa for that person and for the ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Prophet tells you that such a person will exist then. Now, there are some hadith that are not explicit about Al-Mahdi. So some scholars kind of attribute that to Al-Mahdi and say that's him. Other scholars uh, are hesitant and some scholars say that's not Al-Mahdi. So for instance, there's a famous hadith where the Prophet ﷺ says, A person will be given the pledge of leadership of Khilafa meaning in Mecca between a ruqn the corner of the black stone and the Maqam Ibrahim. Just in that spot, somebody will be given the pledge of Khilafa. 
and then an army wants to come and invade and attack that person, whoever had given pledge to them, and Allah Azza wa will destroy that army. Right? So some say that's Al Mahdi. The person who will be given that pledge in the Kaaba is Al Mahdi. And one of the greatest signs that Al Mahdi is there is that Allah will destroy that army. Right? So them, the scholars, some of the scholars will say that is Al Mahdi, although it's not explicit about him. They'll say, don't follow anyone claiming that he's Al Mahdi until you see that sign. Otherwise, anybody could lie. And we'll address that, inshallah. Others say, we don't know if that is Al Mahdi or not because the hadith doesn't mention, so Allahu A'lam. And others say, no, that's not Al Mahdi. So we say, Allahu A'lam. But at least we know that he will come at the end of times. Now, with Al Mahdi, there are some who reject him, like with everything, right? Some who reject him, and some who exaggerate him. So those who reject him, they look first of, first of all at what Muslim sects believed about Al Mahdi and still believe, and they want to separate themselves from it. As some, you know, a Muslim sect today, they still believe that Al Mahdi is alive and he went into a cave as a baby. And he's still alive and kind of people were in communication with him and then that communication stopped and they call it Al-Ghayb Al-Suhra, Al-Ghayb Al-Kubra. So he was uh, a brief concealment then an extended concealment but eventually he will come out but he's alive and whenever they mention him they say Ajjal Allahu Faraja, may Allah bring relief uh, to his ordeal so that he could uh, exit uh, quickly. So that's an extreme. There had been extremes also when it came to Al-Mahdi because when you have that belief but not enough knowledge, anyone can come and claim that he's what? I'm, it's me. You're waiting for me, it's me. So Al-Mahdi here, Al-Mahdi there, whatever a person can fool and dupe the masses by pretending to be righteous, by having, you know, followers, by maybe even, you know, maybe even having some supernatural things happen around him and that could be the work of the devils or could be tricks. If he could convince enough people that he's Al Mahdi, enough people will follow him and it becomes a problem. So when some people looked at all of that, they say, we want to stop this so there is no Mahdi. And they also looked at how some people have turned Al Mahdi into a savior. That is, no matter what happens, wait for Al Mahdi and he will solve everything for us. So they said, no, no. Al-Mahdi, that's not a reality in Islam. So that's an extreme position because you have authentic hadith telling you exactly who Al-Mahdi is, when he will come, how many years he will rule, in addition to other things, inshallah, we'll talk about that he will be performing. So you have to affirm what the Prophet ﷺ has affirmed. Uh, the exaggerations, dismiss them. Educate people about what is right. And what is wrong? So we don't really fool, uh, fall easily into the trap of everybody saying, I'm al-Mahdi, I'm al-Mahdi. Because we have what? Checklist in a sense, right? What's your name? It has to be what? Muhammad, Abdil, Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Okay, what does he look like? Is he from the family of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi or not? And is this authenticated or not? And you look at the circumstances around that person before you give yourself to that belief. You look at the circumstances around him. And when you find that it actually leads into a firm, certain belief, and especially when you have the people of knowledge around confirming that, then you can say, yes, he is al-Mahdi. But don't be duped easily by anyone who's saying, I'm an Mahdi. Even if you begin to see dreams, or even if he begins to see dreams, the dreams on their own are not enough to establish who Al-Mahdi is, right? Otherwise, the Prophet ﷺ would have said, by the way, if you see enough dreams about him, it's him. He didn't give that as a sign, right? He didn't give dreams as a sign. What did he say? He says, that's his name. This is, you know, what he will do. This is how he looks, right? So you look for one and two and three and be cautious before you believe that about him. And you have the people of knowledge who also should confirm all of that because Allah Azza wa Jal will guide them through what they know and through people's taqwa as well. Now, Al-Mahdi will continue to live, right? Uh, during the time of Ad-Dajjal and during the time of Isa alayhi salam. We said that there's an epic battle that will take place. Al-Mahdi will be a leader in that battle. So he said, alayhi salatu wasalam, that you are going to have an alliance with a room. 
Okay, a room. Who are a room? A room is a description of the European Christians. Anyone from that side or who looks like that, right? Those are a room. So you have an alliance with them and you will fight an enemy together and you will win. You and a room will win. And then he said, alayhi salatu wasalam, and then the room will betray you. And there will be a battle between you two. And that is that epic battle that takes place. The other side refers to it as what? Armageddon. Right? The battle of Armageddon. Right? Uh, so that battle will take place. And he said, alayhi salatu wasalam, that the Muslim army, one third of them will flee. Allah will not forgive them for that. Right? And one third will die. And these are among the best martyrs. So imagine with me the intensity of that battle. Right? When you have one third of the Muslim army what, running away. What does that do? Right? And then one third dying. Right? And only one third is left. And that one third is the third that wins the battle. And that is a very decisive battle. And Rasulullah right, he said that they will gather all, I mean, all their might to fight you. And I don't remember the number of the army right now, but if you kind of like multiply it, it exceeds a million. They will bring a large army to fight you, and you will fight them as well. But alhamdulillah, and then al-Mahdi will be the leader in that, in that battle, and the Muslims will win. As soon as they finish, they will hear uh, the news of Ad Dajjal is out. Right? So that's, that's the sequence of it. Ad Dajjal has come out. And now, Ad Dajjal, that's another story. Dajjal, that's another fitna. Right? Because if you think that that battle was bad, right? Or it's intense or it's difficult, now comes Ad Dajjal. And Ad Dajjal, he said about him, alayhi salatu wasalam, there is no fitna. From Adam alayhi salam till the day of judgment that is bigger than Ad Dajjal. So if you imagine uh, all the fitan in the world and all the fitan that we have now, right? And if you look at the fitan that we have now, you say to yourself, My Allah, we're drowning in them. I don't know how we can be saved from them, right? Ad Dajjal is greater than all the fitan that we have today. So what does he say about him alayhi salatu wasalam? Now, first of all, Ad Dajjal is a human being or not? A human being, a human, a human being, except that Allah Azza wa Jalla had given him abilities as a test. In fact, as a test first for him, but also as a test for everybody who's around. And the Prophet ﷺ describes him, okay? He says that he's a short man, very, very curly hair. He says about him also that he's afhaj. Uh, pigeon toed uh, or like the feet I mean they're not straight they're kind of like a bow right so he walks like like he's walking as if each uh, foot or each leg is a bow afhaj that's what they call it um, and what is distinctive about him is that he has flaws in both eyes so when we say one eyed he has two eyes he can only see with one one eye uh, is flat and the other eye is protruding right? and he said also about him alayhi salatu wasalam, that his eye is green the color of his eye is green so one eye is protruding as if it's a floating grape so you put a grape on the water and it floats right that's how protruding it is the other one is flat right it's not protruding and it's not sinking in so there's something wrong with both of his eyes, but he could see only with one. And also, what is written between his eyes? The word kafir. Or kafara. And then all the believers could see this, whether they are literate or not. Allah Azza wa allows them to see this. Um, what did he say about him, alayhi salatu wasalam? Where does he come out from? The beginning, when he comes out from, he comes out from Khurasan. Khurasan is the old name that is given for, to Iran and that area to the east. Right? So from that area, that's the beginning of his, his appearance. And it becomes very visible between Asham and Al-Iraq. So Asham is what? 
Syria, Palestine, Jordan, Lebanon, that is all al Sham al Iraq. So when he's in between, that when he becomes very visible with all of his followers. And Fa'atha Yameen and Wa'atha Fasada. He will corrupt to the right and corrupt to the left. They ask him, O Prophet of Allah, how fast is he? He says, He says, like the clouds being driven by the wind, meaning as fast as the wind. So this is how fast he is. So what makes people, and by the way, what does he claim when he's on earth? He claims that he's what? Allah, God. Allah, I am God. I am your Lord. I am your creator. I am God. That's what the dajjal will claim. Now why do people believe that? Because Allah Azza wa gives him those abilities. Allah gives him those abilities. What, those ability, what are those abilities that tend to convince people that he is God? So first of all, right, the Prophet ﷺ mentions it. He said that he will come to a people and he will say, do you believe in me as what? As God. He say, yes, we believe in you. So he will command the sky to rain and to, it will what? Rain. And the earth to bring its crops and plants and it will do so. So he will leave them because he passes by. He leaves them richer than they were before. Animals are fat. They have water. They have things to eat, meaning they are blessed. And he passes by a village or a town and he says, do you believe in me? And what do they say? No, we don't believe in you. And he will command their uh, crops to, st to stop growing. The rain stops, uh, the sky stops raining. So he leaves them impoverished and, rude, and uh, poor. So they are far worse than before him. And those who believe in him see blessings coming because they believed. He will say to someone, I would say to his followers, he say, would you believe me if I kill this person, split him in half, and then put him back together? They'll say, of course, if you can kill someone and bring him back to life, then you're what? Who, who else could do this, right? God. So he will do this. He will kill someone, split, split him in half, move him far to the two halves, far away from each other so that people could see, and then brings him back, glue him back like that, and then he stands up. And he will go to the nomad, the Bedouin, and he says, if I bring your father and mother back to life, would you believe in me? What does he say? Yeah, of course, right? So he will command and then two devils will take the image of his parents and they will say, Oh son, he is Allah Azza wa believe in him. So obviously what? He believes in him. So he said, alayhi salatu was salam, there will be no place on this earth except that he will reach. Except Mecca and Medina. And there's a had another hadith that also says Al-Aqsa and At-Tur. Okay, it adds those. But when he wants to come to Mecca and Medina, he finds what? That there are angels protecting Medina. So he cannot enter. But subhanAllah, I mean, it's not enough for you to be in Medina to be protected because if you're in Medina, but you are not a believer, you'll go out to see him. Right? So he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, فَتَرْجُفُ الْمَدِينَ ثَلَاثَ رَجَفَاتِ is that the Medina will shake three times. So anyone who has hypocrisy in his heart will run out of Medina. So you must be strong to stay in Medina. So the place on its own is not enough until what? You really have Iman. Right? And also he said, alayhi salatu was salam, that many women will follow him. Many women will follow him. To the extent that a man would go home and will tie some of his relatives or his wife before he leaves out of the fear that she will sneak out to join a Dajjal. And if you want to think about it, I mean, what would a person do if the person hears God is right outside the city? God. Go and see him. Do you want to understand the fitna? Because we may be talking about it today and we may not think that it's much of a fitna. But I want you actually to imagine that God is outside. And you know what he can do? And you know how he can help? And you know what he can show you? God is outside. The intensity of the fitna where you just want to run and see. And the Prophet ﷺ, by the way, he also said, and that's from the fiqh of a dajjal or the fitna of a dajjal. 
Man sami'a bi dajjal If you hear about the dajjal Should you go and see him? Or you run away to the mountains, right? To the top of the mountains Because he said alayhi salatu was salam Because a person would be uh, would think that they are have such a strong faith they would go and meet a Dajjal and they end up following him because of all the things that he has with him you know he comes he said alayhi salatu wasalam he comes and he has what appears to be like heaven and hell next to him and he, when he's walking he has Jannah and Nar beside him can you imagine I just, just really I want you to imagine how difficult that will be okay and so, if he's happy with someone, it will put him in that Jannah. And that Jannah is what? The opposite, is hell. And if he's angry with someone, he'll throw him in what appears to be the fire. And that fire is what? That's the opposite. There's water. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's water. It's beautiful, cold water. But that is the appearance that he goes with. And at Dajjal is not simply strong because he's only at Dajjal, because everybody believes in him. Everybody believes in him. And everybody defends him. And everybody, you know, uh, attacks those who disbelieve in him. And he said, alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, how long will he stay? He said, 40 days. 40 days, right? But 40 days we, where he can take control of this entire earth, or whatever is left of it. We don't know what continents are still, you know, inhabited or not. Whatever is left, he takes control of all of it, except these spots that we talked about. One, two... That's it. One, two, three, four. So he said, 40 days. They said, O Prophet of Allah, are these regular days? He says, No. One day is like a year, actual year. And one day is like a month, one day is like a week, and the rest are regular days. So this is how long he will stay. And everybody believes. And it's an intense fitna. And who's the only one, right? Who's the only one that can kill a Dajjal? Isa. Isa alayhi salam. Before that also, uh, there's an incident, it says, where uh, someone comes out to meet a Dajjal, protesting who a Dajjal is. So first he meets some of the helpers of a Dajjal, and he says, where is that person who is claiming that he's a Dajjal, or he's al-Masih? So these believers in a Dajjal, they say, oh, you don't believe in our Rabb? He says, no, I don't. Take me to see him, or something like that. So they take him to see a Dajjal. And he said, you're the one who Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said this and this and this about. He turns to his followers, the Dajjal, Dajjal will say, and he says, if I kill this man, and then put him back together, and bring him back to life, would you believe in me? They say, yes, our belief will intensify. So he takes this man, and he kills him, right? And he then brings him back to life. And he says, see, and, but he, also he predicts and he says, I'll bring him back to life, but even after that, he's not going to believe in me. So he brings him back to life and he says to his followers, see, and they say, we testify that you are Allah, that you are the Rabb. But that person who was brought back to life, he says, now I know more than before that you are at the jail that the Prophet Sallallahu had talked about. So he wants to go and kill him again. And the Prophet ﷺ, he says that Allah Azza will protect him. He'll be shielded with copper along all of his body. He cannot reach him. So he'll take him by the feet and throw him in what appears to be hell. But it's not. And then the Prophet ﷺ said he will not be able to kill anybody afterwards. He'll not be able to kill anybody afterwards. Meaning that's the last person he could kill. And that is the signal, the beginning of his loss of power. Because he can't kill anybody. And then Isa alayhi salam descends to kill him. We'll talk about Isa alayhi salam shortly. But before I move on to Isa alayhi salam and the death of the dajjal there's also what is we call the, the fiqh. The fiqh, the understanding of the fitna of the dajjal Because the dajjal is not just simply about a man who's going to come and he can do these things. It's also about learning about fitna altogether. And how to protect yourself from fitna. So how do, first of all, how do you protect yourself from a dajjal What are the things that you could do to protect yourself from a dajjal So first of all, the Prophet ﷺ, he said that if you meet him, you read what surah, or the beginning of what surah? Al-Kahf. Surah Al-Kahf. So this is something that if you're afraid about the fitna of a dajjal you go back to surah Al-Kahf, 
and you memorize at least the last 10 ayahs in it and you try to understand what it means, right? Of how Allah Azza wa protects the people of the cave and how Allah Azza wa you know, you know, talks to Musa and then Dhul Qarnayna, what have you, because in it there is guidance and can protect you from a Dajjal. So that's, that's one. Second of all, there is the fiqh of avoiding the fitna. Not testing yourself and not bringing yourself closest to what could tempt you. Even if you think that, your iman is strong. Even if you think that, you have all the answers. There's a difference between finding yourself in the fitna because it was unavoidable. And another where you seek it yourself. So if you seek the fitna yourself, who had given you a guarantee that your heart is not going to change? That you're not going to see something that will not change your mind. The shaitan will not tempt you. That a weakness of yours in mind that is not really apparent to you will resurface. And how many of us have weaknesses that we're not aware of that resurface, right? So you think that you're strong, but when it comes to the fitna of money, you find yourself weak. I didn't think that I was that weak, but now you're weak. There's something that you and I did not treat. So avoiding a fitna is one of the best ways I mean, staying away from it to protect yourself from that fitna. Also, knowledge about Ad Dajjal. The more that you know, and the more that you apply what you know, the more that Allah Azza wa will protect you. So, that man who the Prophet said he is among the greatest witnesses with Allah Azza wa Jal, when he goes to meet Ad Dajjal and confront him, how did he know that he was Ad Dajjal? Because he learned. What Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said. He says, you're the one that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa told us about. So the more that you know, the more that you'll be able to avoid a fitna. So in general, all the fitan, and at the Dajjal in particular, that's why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would warn them time after time about at the Dajjal until actually some of the Sahaba were afraid that the Dajjal is close by. He's just going to appear. Of how many times the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had mentioned him and warned people about him. Another is that despite, despite uh, the evidence that Allah Azza wa had given that a Dajjal is imposter, people are still willing to believe in him as a God. So for the believers, they could see between his eyes written what? Kafir. So that's very clear proof that he is a Kafir. Taib, even if a person is a non-believer, is there proof in a Dajjal physically, that he is not God? And what is this proof? Huh? Defects. Okay? That he is not uh, handsome, he is not complete, and there's a defect in his body and in his eyes. So when you know about Allah Azza wa what you know about Allah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he said, he says, I've mentioned so many things about Ad-Dajjal. I've talked to you a lot about Ad-Dajjal. I said, until I am afraid, you will not remember all of this. فإن, يعني, if it's difficult for you, then know that Allah Azza wa is not a'war, is not one-eyed. That if you forget all the things that the Prophet ﷺ had said, even if you forget all the things we talked about today, where he's going to come out, who will follow him, where he's going to die, all of this. Forget all of this. Remember one thing. Allah is not what? He's not awar. Because the very, very first thing that you could tell him if you see him and he's claiming that he's God is what? Go and fix yourself. Go and fix yourself. So if he cannot, Allah Azza wa had given you a contradiction, physical contradiction that this cannot be God. Why does Allah Azza wa give him that ability? We said it is a test. A test to do what? A test to see. Do you believe in Allah's Sharia? Or do you believe in the supernatural in front of you when it contradicts Allah's Sharia? Because this person goes against the Quran and Sunnah and he says, I am God. And the Quran tells you, you cannot believe in that. But he's reviving the dead. The Quran Sunnah tells you, I cannot be, you cannot believe in that. But he's asking for the sky to rain and it rains. How do you reconcile all of this? Is to know that supernatural ability on its own is not sufficient to prove that someone is right or wrong. So if someone today disappears from one place to the other, and I mean genuinely disappears, is that enough proof that he's a prophet or beloved by Allah Azza wa Jal? 
So what could be the explanation behind him disappearing from one place to the other? Magic. Shayateen could carry him. Do we have an explanation, right? So that in itself is no indication that someone is favored by Allah or is not a wali by Allah Azza wa Jal. As some of the Salaf have said, if you see someone walking on water, don't believe that he's a wali of Allah Azza wa Jal until you do what? See if he agrees with the Quran and Sunnah or not. Or if you see him flying in the air, like physically see him flying in the air, don't believe that he's a wali until you see that he agrees with the Quran and Sunnah. If not, you need to dismiss him. So supernatural ability, no matter what he does, is not enough on its own to convince you that he is righteous, let alone that he is God. So if you see him in that created form, he's a human being, flawed, it says in the hadith also, he is sterile. La he does not have children. That is another flaw. He cannot have children. It says, if that's the case, why do you believe that this flawed being could be the creator if he cannot fix himself and he comes in this flawed, ugly form? Okay? Another thing, inshallah, maybe that's the last thing uh, we'll mention about the dajjal kind of like benefits that come from it, is that as I was thinking about it, I think that those who are materialists, atheists, are most vulnerable to a belief in a Dajjal than those who are not. Wallahu alam. That is so because as a person that you believe in the supernatural, you have an explanation for what a Dajjal does, right? Right? Okay. If a person does not believe in the supernatural at all, only in matter, and what he sees and what he feels. And he tries to interpret everything as there's a scientific explanation to it. It's like, if a Dajjal comes to such a person and he says, I'm going to kill someone in front of you right now and bring him back to life. What would be a scientific explanation to that? Any? Like I can kill him, kill him, actually kill him, separate um, the two parts of the body as far as the arrow can be thrown. Meaning very far. And then bring it back. Can science bring people to life like that? Or if he says to the sky, rain and it rains, what scientific explanation do you have for this? So if he actually can perform these supernatural acts, and he is and will be, a person who does not believe in the supernatural, but only in matter and in science, his belief shatters. There's nothing to explain any of this. The only thing that is left for them is to believe that this being is honest in what he's saying because I haven't seen anything like that before and I have nothing that can account for this and explain it. What is left? He's, not, he's right. He must be because he's doing things that are beyond what I thought possible. A believer, on the other hand, you see all of these things and you say what? I know about you. I have an explanation already. I know that there is a world of jinn. I know Allah could enable some people to do miraculous, what seems to be like miraculous things, out of a test or as a test for us. But that does not mean that they are right. So you have an explanation because you believe in the supernatural. They don't have an explanation at all because they disbelieve in all of it. So at the Jal, when he comes, he will be able to attract those hearts and well. Now, I don't know by that time will we have atheists, right? But I'm just telling you that when a person disbelieves in that side of reality, and the supernatural is a reality, your whole belief system could be shattered if you see things that you cannot explain. Right? And yeah, he says now, Rahimatullah Isa ibn Maryam will descend and will kill him. So Isa ibn Maryam, he said, alayhi salatu was salam, Isa will descend. He says, at the white minaret, east of Damascus. So he will descend there. And he describes him, alayhi salatu wasalam, that angels will be carry him, that he will be wearing yellowish garments. And then he will head, alayhi salam, to Jerusalem. So in Jerusalem, right, the Muslims are there. And they're fighting at Dajjal and his army. And Al-Mahdi is there. And Isa descends, and it comes time for Fajr Salah. Salatul Fajr. 
And Al-Mahdi, the Prophet وسلم, that's how we know that Al-Mahdi is there. فَيَقُولُ أَمِيرُهُ الْمَهْدِي تَقَدَّمْ فَصَلِّ بِنَا So Al-Mahdi, who is there, Amir, will say to Isa, alayhi salam, you lead the salah. Salah to what? Al-Fajr, right? So Isa, alayhi salam, he says, your imam will be from you, تَكْرِيمَةُ اللَّهِ لِهَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ Allah's honor for this ummah. So of course, right, when you see Isa, and he's down, who's the one who's supposed to lead the salah? Isa, you think, of course, you have a prophet who is better suited than him to be the imam. But Isa, alayhi salam, wants to show that what? You know, that he had come to as a follower of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? So that's why some, some of the, um, some of Ahlul Ilm, right? They deduced from that or uh, kind of that created a puzzle. And they would say, who is the prophet who is both a prophet and a sahabi? In a sense, right? Because Isa alayhi salam saw Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, right? He saw him, but he's not dead. Like all the other prophets of Allah azza wa they're dead. But Isa alayhi salam, he saw him and he is still alive. So they say, who's a prophet and a sahabi as well, right? Allah alam. So they say that's Isa alayhi salam. So Isa descends and then Al Mahdi leads the salah, salatul fajr. So that's the first salah that Isa alayhi salam will pray there in, in Jerusalem. And then they will open the gates. And Rasulullah says about Isa that he says that any disbeliever who smells or gets to smell Isa alayhi salam will die. And that includes al Masih al-Dajjal. So when Masih al-Dajjal sees, gets the sight of Isa alayhi salam, he runs away. Because he knows that it's over. It's done. And if we, he were to leave him, and Isa alayhi salam does not go after him, he would die. But Isa alayhi salam goes after him and he catches up with him as he says, Bibabi Lud. So a Lud is a city in Palestine. So Bab Lud could be the gate of Lud or a gate in Lud, Wallahu A'lam. But a Lud is a city in Palestine. So he catches up with him in a Lud and he pierces him with a spear and he kills him. Right? And that is the end of Ad Dajjal. That's how he terminates Ad Dajjal. And then everybody afterwards, right? Everybody afterwards will believe in Isa alayhi salam as a prophet of Allah. And all the milal, all the different religions, all will disappear and there will only be one religion, which is the religion of Islam. And by the way, also something that I forgot to mention about Ad Dajjal, it says like, why, why do people believe in him so much? Uh, one of the reasons you could say it's it's economic as well. He said, alayhi salatu wasalam, is that before the dajjal comes, there'll be three years of famine and drought. So for the first year, one third of the rain and crops will stop. The one third of the rain, annual rain, will stop. So the crops will be affected because of that. The second year, two thirds of the rain that falls on earth will stop, and the crops, two thirds of them will also stop. The third year, all of the rain will stop for one year. And all the crops will stop. Just imagine, right? When it stops raining. And when we you know, went through corona and COVID and what have you, remember some of the, those kind of shortages of food here and there and what that did to us? So imagine and there, the war here and the war there and then uh, decrease in wheat and decrease in barley and what, and what that does to us and to the prices. طيب. Because that's, that's the benefit of going through these crises, right? It's just you begin to relate what, to what's going to happen later. So if no crops on earth are produced in one year, what happens? SubhanAllah. Right? Not only prices, deaths also. Despair. So when at the jal then at the end of this comes and he says to a village, do you believe in me? And they say yes, and he allows it to rain, and it rains, what is that going to do? Of course I will believe in you, because I'm dying of hunger, right? I don't have anything to eat, and I've heard about you blessing these lands, and then you're here, and I can see you blessing all of us. Of course you're God, and not only God, I'll die for you. That's, that's, that's how, how hard it is, right? And that's why... Uh, when we said a lot of women will go to join him because oh, women tend to be more emotional than men. So if you know that God is there, he will talk to you, he will listen to you. Of course, it's a very emotional um, state. And that's why more of them will go and, and, and follow at Dajjal. So 
he said, alayhi salatu was salam, by the way, as, as a way of conclusion about al-Mahdi, and then after Isa, alayhi salam, is that when al-Mahdi comes, he fills the earth with justice, as it was filled with injustice. And then Allah also, he said, alayhi salatu was salam, that Allah will bless this earth. Now, when, did, when is this exactly? Is it before Isa comes or after Isa comes when he talks about al-Mahdi? I do not know. But he said, alayhi salatu was salam, that the earth will be so blessed that people will come and they say to al-Mahdi, give us money. And he will just give him without account. Take as much as you need, right? Heaps and heaps of money if you want money. After Isa alayhi salam, of course, comes Ya'juj and Ma'juj, but he doesn't talk about Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So maybe we'll talk about them next time or maybe not. But just I want to talk about the blessing period. After the demise of Ya'juj and Ma'juj, he said alayhi salatu was salam that Isa will live for 40 years. Isa will leave alayhi salam for 40 years and then he will die and Muslims will bury him and pray janazah for him. But during those 40 years, that is a period of peace and abundance where Allah Azza will bless this earth. There is no better, more blessed period on this earth than when Isa alayhi salam will come. And one main reason for that is that there is only iman on this earth and there is no disbelief. Nobody believes in uh, other than Allah Azza wa No one worships other than Allah Azza wa And because Isa is there, they know that the day of judgment is near. So they're not worried about money, they're not worried about greed, they're worried about pleasing Allah Azza wa So Allah blesses the crops on this earth, so what would normally for, be enough for one person will be enough for ten. It'd be huge, it'll be enough for ten. And he said, Allah, alayhi salatu wa sallam, Allah will take or extract the enmity from this earth, so you will have the tiger and the wolf, you know, grazing with or sitting beside the rabbit and the gazelle. There's no enmity between them on this earth. Not between animals and not between human beings as well. And even you know, to the extent at the time of Isa alayhi salam is that you want to give people money, they say we're not interested in money anymore. A sajda, a prostration to Allah azza wa is dearer to them than the money, the gold and silver that you could give to them. So it's an incredible time that will be at the time of Isa alayhi salam while he is alive. But of course what precedes that are really trials and tribulations and a lot of fitan, right? So we'll see inshallah. Maybe we could talk about Ya'juj and Ma'juj briefly next time. But that is what I had about, briefly about Al-Mahdi and then Al-Dajjal and then Isa ibn Maryam. So I want to pause here inshallah and see if you guys have questions or maybe something that I've missed. Maybe inshallah you could remind me and we can add it to our discussion today, inshallah. So anything I've missed? I know there's more, right? And by the way, Dajjal is alive today or not? Yeah, he's alive. So there's a hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu I think it's Sahih Muslim, where some of the Sahaba was lost. One of the Sahaba was lost uh, in the sea. And he came upon an island, and then, you know, etc., etc. And then he saw a Dajjal being tied up in that island, and a Dajjal was telling him what happened to this, what happened to this. And he included in that what happened. Did Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam appear? He said, yes, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam appeared. He asked him about Buhayra Tabariya, the lake of Tabariya, which is a lake in, in, uh, uh, in Philistine. He says, did it dry, dry out yet? He says, no, it's not yet. He says, it's going to dry out. So he was talking about an nakhlu He says the, the palm trees of Baysan. He says, are they dead or is it, uh, I'm not sure exactly, but he said, what happened to it? And he said, it's still there. And he said, no, it's, something's going to happen to it. See, he was asking the Dajjal about science. What's going to happen to understand, is it time for him to come out or not yet? Right? So he's alive, but he's being tied up. Now, where exactly? Allah knows. But when Allah allows it, he's going to come out. And when he comes out, he's going to wreak havoc, and people will follow him except the believers. Right. Now, like, inshallah, let's, let's scan the room and see if anybody here on my left. Nobody, 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 nobody. Okay. Strange. I thought you would have questions, right? <laughs> no, no, you don't have to have questions. Maybe it's like, okay, that's too much. We just want to go home. Naam, naam, Ya'juj and Ma'juj are in existence now. We don't know where they are. Yeah. 
Oh, so Isa does not cease to be a Nabi. He's always a Nabi, right? No, no, he, he gets Wahi but does not get a new Sharia. Like it's not a line new Sharia, except the Sharia that the Prophet ﷺ uh, talked about. He breaks the cross, he you know, uh, kills the pig, he does not accept any religion except Islam. So that yeah, happens then. But he's a prophet of Allah Azzawajal that still receives revelation because it does say, for instance, when Ya'juj and Ma'juj will come, Allah will tell Isa, I've let slaves of mine, which is Ya'juj and Ma'juj, uh, come out. And no one has the power to fight them. So he tells him. And then it tells you also in the hadith that Isa will, um, after, after the battle with Ad-Dajjal, he will sit with Muslims and he will tell them about their stations in Jannah. You'll be in Jannah here, you'll be in Jannah here, you'll be in Jannah here. So a prophet of Allah Azza wa Jal till the end. Yeah, and he's, he's a follower of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but a prophet as well. So his sharia is the sharia, sharia of Muhammad, does not get cancelled. But he's a prophet following the sharia of Muhammad alayhi salatu wa Yes, these are the people that survived the fitna. Yeah, I mean, yeah, these are the, your, your children or grandchildren or, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe it's not very likely that you will see him, Allahu A'lam, but... Who? Yeah, but if you passed all of this, right, well... Yes, 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 right. No, inshallah. Okay, yeah, Dabba will come after this, right? That's towards the end, after that. Because it's, it's going to, because see, Dabba will put a sign on people, right? Believer, disbeliever, right? So at the time of Isa, there are no disbelievers. So that comes after. And they say it's, it's going to be kind of um, around, around that sun rising from uh, the, what is it rise from? The west, right? So it's rising from this. And then because at that point, You'll be able to tell people, right, apparently, physically, who's a believer and who's not. But that does not happen at the time of Isa, so later. Yes. Yes, so a decline. So after Isa, alayhi salam, right, after that golden period, people will start what, losing gradually their faith until eventually there will be no believers on this earth and only disbelievers. So that's the great period of decline. And there's a decline that there is no what reversal to. That's it. It has to happen that way. Right. Yeah. So the Dajjal doesn't have to ask Allah for it. Allah gives him that ability. So Wallahu A'lam, you know, he could have had, had it, you know, from a very young age that he could notice with himself. That's speculative on my part, right? He could notice that if he says this to happen, it will happen. So Allah gives him that ability that if you ask for this, it's going to happen. If you wish for this, it's going to happen. If you command this, if you kill something, he could bring it back. So he doesn't have to uh, physically, consciously, explicitly ask for it. He just does it or wants it and it happens. Yeah. So will he have He's a disbeliever by the fact that he claims that he is a... Um, uh, Allah Azza wa himself. Either you know, and whether it, he believes but still claims or he disbelieves. In either way, he's a disbeliever, right? Yeah. I don't know, I, Allahu A'lam. I don't know exactly, right? So those seven that the Prophet Sallallahu said, uh, talked about, are they before that epic battle, before Ad-Dajjal, post Ad-Dajjal? How do they actually square with the rain, let's call it the rain, or the presence of Isa alayhi salam? I'm not exactly sure. He just told us about seven uh, years for Al-Mahdi, 40 for Isa alayhi salam, but I don't know how that intersects. Allahu A'lam. Yeah, so. He said, he says, he's a, like a great being, like, or a great figure that he saw. So uh, this Wallah Alam may be a form that the Dajjal took, but then he takes another form later on, right? 
And that could be related, Allahu A'lam, to either magic or to the devils or to the shayateen. But the form that he saw him in is not exactly the form that he'll appear in. So, Allahu A'lam, I, I don't know the, why here, this way, and why when we see him, he's going to be different. But that's what he described. Naam, naam. So uh, the Jal before he comes, there shall be a uh, shortage of shortage of knowledge, decrease of knowledge, right? And that could be related to the droughts that we talked about, uh, tribulations that we talked about, the battles that we talked about, a lot of injustice happening. So there is a decrease in knowledge, and people will know less about him. And that's why they, some, some have said it's important to keep the mention of the Dajjal alive and to know about him. As the Prophet ﷺ kept what? Mentioning and warning people about the Dajjal so that you save yourself from it. Who knows, right? Maybe the information that you pass on to your family or your loved ones keeps, it stays alive and it saves someone, right? So that's why it keeps, it's important to keep transmitting that information. Allah alam, yeah. It says the first ten. The first ten. Yeah. The first ten. Fawatih Surat al Kaf. He says Fawatih Surat al Kaf. Inshallah. Okay. So anyone else? So just my last scan. No? Tayyib. Khair inshallah. Jazakumullah khaira. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa tubulik. Alhamdulillah rabbil alim.